No part of this audio lecture may be used without the express written permission of Rick Ramos or Contra Costa College. How you doing? This is Professor Rick Ramos, and this is continuing lecture series in criminal procedures. Today's topic is lecture number five, which is booking and jail procedures. If you're preparing for a post-academy test, this would be learning domain 31, custody. If you've made an arrest, depending on whether it's a misdemeanor or a felony, the options upon arrest are to have the suspect sign a citation and set a court date, take them to the station, have them post bail, and also set a court date. If you arrest them Monday through Friday, you know, 8, 9 in the morning, you probably can get them before a magistrate. If it's a regular court day before noon. And last, place them in the jail pending a court appearance if they can't make bail. There are a variety of different types of jails. There are city jails, which are run by the chief of police of that specific municipality, or there are county jails. Smaller departments do not have jails. They transport to a county facility uh, where, they book the, where they book the suspect at the county facility, and at that point they become the safekeeping and custody problem of that facility. County jail is run by the sheriff's department. If you were looking for why people would be in custody in a jail, let me give you kind of a list here. They'd be waiting for presentation before magistrate. They haven't posted bail. They're under arrest, and they're waiting for charges to see if they're going to be held to answer. Upon the order of a magistrate, in other words, they've been arrested pursuant to a warrant for their arrest. Upon confinement for persons sent into misdemeanor convictions, for those in confinement for contempt of court. In other words, they disrespected the judge and the judge is going to hold them in custody as a punishment. For confinement of witnesses who may flee. In other words, if you remember the uh, famous housekeeper for O.J. Simpson allegedly had a ticket set to go back to Guatemala and Judge Ito basically ordered her into the jail and of course they're going to be separated from the criminals until she testified unless she posted $5,000 bail, and of course Johnny Cochran posted it. But the thing is, is this. If you have a witness, and you're worried the witness is going to split, you can put the witness in temporary custody. Again, it's going to be in a really safe environment. It's not going to be with the regular criminals. Also, you'll find people who are, who are arrested for parole or probation violations, and they're waiting for their probation or parole officer to make contact with them, make a decision if they're going to revoke or not, and so they're held in custody with no bail. For those in transit to other courts, somebody's coming from L.A. to Eureka and they stop in San Francisco because their prisoner van broke down and they need to spend the night and so they would house the prisoner in the county jail. And also detention of certain juveniles under 208 WNI and those would be juveniles who are, you have to have a separate area for them that are um, committing dangerous crimes and going to get charged as a, an adult. What is custody? The definition of custody is immediate charge and control exercised by a person or an authority over a ward, suspect, or inmate. This is done while ensuring the inmate's safety and civil rights. The first step of the booking process is to validate the arrest. You'll fill out a basic face sheet for a crime report and you'll put a short narrative in establishing corpus delecti of the crime, or the elements of the crime, and also probable cause for arrest of the suspect. If it's a misdemeanor, it would be a misdemeanor in your presence. If it's a felony, it could be in or out of your presence. At that point, we actually will start the formal booking process. So let's talk about what normally happens in the booking procedure. You make an arrest on the street. Let's, I'll give you an example. I made an arrest one time for an assault with a deadly weapon, and I bring the suspect in the suspect fills out a form which basically gives all of his horsepower name address date of birth height weight i verify all that we might even measure him look at uh we have a stand-up measuring device that we would use i run a criminal history to determine if there's any other aliases this person uses to to put that on to the booking form I then pull out a pop property receipt, which if you look in the back of the workbook, I gave you a copy of one, and it basically has listed miscellaneous articles that you might take from somebody like a belt and a watch and a pen and money and what the denomination of money is, how many dollar bills, how many $5 bills, how many $10 bills. We need to be exact in this sort of stuff. It's accurate description of the property. 
So take a look at that property receipt in the back. We're going to fingerprint the individual and photograph them. And this is done digitally using what we call live scan now. We use a digital scanner that scans the fingerprints. And it could do a quick check to see if there's any outstanding warrants for the person or if they're giving me false ID. Put that through the system. We're going to put them in. If, we're, if they're going to make bail, then we're not going to do an extended search of them unless it was a gun, a weapon, or drug violation that we brought them in for. If they're not going to make bail and they're going to go into the general jail population, then they're going to go in a holding cell. And by gender, if it's a female, a female will do this. If it's a male, a male will do this. They will be asked to take off each piece of their clothing. And you're going to wear plastic gloves and you're going to go through each piece of clothing, make sure they don't have anything. They'll basically bend over, spread their cheeks, make sure they have nothing in the butt cheeks. I know that's gross, guys, but that's something we have to do. They'll shake out their hair. Uh, if it's a woman, she's going to probably have to do some other things, raise her arms, probably raise her breasts up to make sure she doesn't have anything. You'd be surprised that's, that uh, you know stone-cold criminals will carry razor blades and such, try to get them into the jail. At that point, we'll give them some jail clothing, and that might be overalls. Some jails will allow them to have their clothes back. They'll wear their regular clothes. Some jails will require them to wear a specific color jumpsuit, that's going to end. Usually they'll have different colors for different things. A convict will wear blue and someone who's not a convict will wear a, d a different color. Who knows? Pink, yellow, green, whatever it is to signify they have not been sentenced yet, that they're waiting for trial. The next step is medical pre-screening. Every peace officer is responsible for the care, protection, and safety of each person arrested or otherwise in custody. The initial responsibility of medical screening lies with that arresting officer to be certain that the person arrested is not suffering from any injury, mental illness, drug overdose, or intoxication, or other conditions that might require medication or treatment. If the officer believes that the arrested person is in urgent need of treatment, then they should take them to a medical facility to be checked and make sure that the doctor fills out a form which basically says they're fit for incarceration because the next step is is you're gonna have to go to your jail intake officer whether it's a city jail or a county jail and the jail intake or custodial person receiving the arrested person should complete a medical questionnaire on each person received and again they may ask you for clearance for this person to be incarcerated otherwise they will not take them because they are responsible for the person and that piece of paper from the doctor relieves you of any further responsibilities and it does say in PC 4, 4015 that all prisoners should be interviewed and inspected by the booking officer to ensure they have no medical problems prior to placement in the holding facility. Final note I talked about in Lecture 3, uh, the USC Title 18, Section 241242, uh, failure to provide medical attention can place the Department in civil liability for uh, violation of the civil rights of the individual and you say well how does that work well you're responsible for them if someone comes into the jail and they have a concussion and they're complaining they want to see a doctor and you ignore that and they die from the concussion you are liable after you've taken somebody through the process and this is something you might do before we do the booking process they're allowed to have three completed phone calls under PC 851.5 within three hours on, after arrest unless there's some physical difficulty there the jails backed up there's 60 people in line waiting to use three phones then that would be a valid excuse but usually that's not the case they have to pay for the cost of the calls and, and um, normally it's at the suspect's expense. The purpose of the calls is for them to be able to call their attorney, their bails person, and also a relative. Also, you should note that under BMP 6152, it's illegal to, to give them the name of a bail bonds person or an attorney. And this is a big problem in the East Coast. There's officers that get in trouble all the time for getting kickbacks from bail bonds companies and also attorneys for sending them clients that they arrest. It's kind of a revolving door. I make an arrest. I send you to the bail bonds. The bail bonds. Your bail is a hundred grand. The bail bonds makes ten grand, and the officer gets a kickback of a grand. Now that doesn't happen on the West Coast. We actually have a law that says, if you suggest an attorney, a bail bonds person for the suspect, it's a twenty-five hundred dollar fine and six months in county jail or both. Additionally, your police department may discipline you for such action. Another legal requirement of custody staff is the obligation to allow jail inmates the rights to have visits on demand by certain types of professionals, including physicians, surgeons, psychiatrists, and often psychologists, along with the attorney of record or one requested by the inmate 
or his or her family. As a matter of fact, it's a $500 fine for a person in charge who refuses attorney visit at the request of the suspect or any of their relatives. After the booking procedure is complete, it's time to do the classification of the inmate before they're placed into population. This is where they're separated by class and gender, and there's a variety of different characteristics that might be looked at. First of all, male and female prisoners are not placed together. Next, any inmates who are there as a result of contempt of court in a civil court case cannot be placed in custody in an area where there are criminal defendants. They have to be separate. Earlier, I spoke about potential witnesses being held in jail pending their testimony. Those potential witnesses cannot be held with criminal defendants. Another classification we'd look at is diplomats, people who are from other countries. They may not have diplomatic immunity, but we want to make sure we keep them separate from the general population. Again, the other factors we look at in classification is age, type of offense, and violence tendency. You don't want to put a young 18-year-old male who's you know, 5'4", 140 pounds in a jail cell with a sexual predator who's 6'4", 280 pounds. Gang affiliation is a big thing. You know, gangs are so prevalent now, we have a responsibility to make sure you don't put two rival gang members together because they're going to fight to the death. And again, we're going to be held liable. There's also protective custody. We may have people who are former police or correctional officers. We can't just put them in the general population. Other characteristics in protective custody would include gay and lesbian inmates, certain sex offenders, including child molesters, because convicts and inmates really look down on child molesters, and if they can, they will do them harm. And certain other crimes that are what we would call infamous crimes or crimes that have a lot of media attention, you might have some inmate that wants to get some sort of notoriety by killing that particular suspect. Other options that can occur include site and release. If the person is a local resident, they have ties to the community, they are lo they're, have local employment, maybe they own a company there, they have family ties, where you know they're going to show up for court. There may be a decision that's made at some point by a jail supervisor to release the person on citation, or they may also qualify for OR. Now, in the city of Berkeley, in Alameda County, they have an OR project, and these are trained evaluators who actually come into the jail, and they interview those people that have a potential to be OR'd. It's a lengthy process. It's almost like doing a background investigation. Then they provide this investigation to the judge. Now, I personally had a young man who had been doing some gardening around my house. He didn't drink alcohol, ex-Vietnam vet. I mean, this guy was a great guy, and um, I had a lot of trust in him. He'd never been arrested before. Matter of fact, he'd babysat my kids after doing gardening so that I could go out to dinner with lot to dinner. So I had a lot of trust in this young man, and I got a call one day from the OR project saying that Judge Carol Brosnahan had, uh, he had listed me as a reference, and she wanted to know if I thought he was worthy of OR. And I said, yes, I, I thought he was worthy of OR. I said, what's he there for? Oh, petty theft. I said, it's got to be a mistake. This guy is just a great guy. He's not going to do something like that. Little did I know he had become a crack addict, and, uh, you know, that stuff steals your soul. So he had totally changed his behavior pattern. And he didn't show up for court. So as a result, I got a personal phone call from Judge Brosnahan saying, Sergeant Ramos, you know what? You signed off on this guy. I expect you to find him. I have a warrant for his arrest day or night. Go get him. And I knew where the guy lived, so I was able to pick him up. But that's how OR works. The judge approves it based upon a background investigation that's going to be done. I want to talk a little bit about different types of searches that occur in the jail and outside the jail facility. We've already talked about stop and frisk on the street, we would stop and frisk somebody. If we make an arrest pursuant to Chamel, we're looking for FICE, remember that fruits of the crime instrumentality, contraband, and other evidence, and we would do a, a search of inside the pockets and inside the, uh, we might make them take off their shoes, their coat, go through basic stuff, but you're not gonna have somebody take off their clothes out on the street. If you bring them into the jail facility or holding cell facility and it is a crime where you believe they have weapons or drugs, then you can have them remove their clothing, but it's only for visual search only. In other words, you can have them manipulate stuff, move their hair around, move body parts around so you can see, but you really are not supposed to touch them. If you believe that somebody has 
uh, secreted contraband, you know, inside their body. Pretty gross, but they've done. I've seen people do it before, and you need to do a physical body cavity search. Guess what? The police don't do that. That's not our expertise. Doctors do that. So what you have to do is write a search warrant, have a judge sign it, and then you take it to the hospital, and a physician will perform the court-ordered body cavity search. Many times, new case law or procedure regarding jails is made because certain employees do things they shouldn't do, not best practices. There was a case that came out of the city of Berkeley where we had to pay $125,000 to a female for an illegal strip search. She had been brought to us by UC Berkeley Police Department. As a demonstrator, she had only a $350 pooper scooper violation out of San Francisco. She was placed in a holding cell, and we had a female jailer who was not a model employee, and she decided that she was going to go to lunch with her girlfriends. Now, to do that when you have an inmate in a holding cell, that's a no-no. You have to place them in the jail population, then you have to let dispatch and the clerks downstairs know to listen up over these speakers in case a person calls, etc., etc., because then they have a bathroom, they have water, they have an emergency button they can press, things like that. So she took this woman and the woman said, wait a minute, my friends are going to be here within an hour, you know, and I don't want to be strip searched. She said, remember I said if they're going in the general population, they have to be strip, strip searched. So she ordered her to be strip searched, and the woman did it. And as a result, the friends came there within about 15, 20 minutes after she had left her there in the jail. And they made a complaint to me. I was a jail sergeant. We wrote it up, and we ended up getting sued over the situation. We ended up terminating the jailer. The end result was that it required jails to have a waiting area outside the jail where a person could wait for up to three hours to make bail. So this caused some problems. We had to take some designated cells with bathrooms and make them holding areas where people could wait for bail. People could waive time. Now, we had just put a new jail in, and the jails had HBO showtime in certain rooms with a telephone. There was a payphone. It only held one person. We had about 12 of these cells, and then there was a general population cell with uh, that could hold about 30 people. So if you wanted to get in there early or you wanted to get dinner, you knew they were serving dinner and you wanted dinner, you know, you could waive that time and say, hey, forget it. My friends aren't coming to get me. I'm not waiting three hours. Put me up there. I want to go. And that's kind of how new rules come down because best practices aren't followed. Again, I want to talk about strip searches, the visual ones, only on misdemeanors where drugs or weapons were involved, and only on felonies and misdemeanors where the defendant will be placed in the jail facility after having ample time to make bail. If they waive that three-hour time period, then you're okay. It may only be performed by a staff person of the same sex as a person being searched. And again, physical body cavity search only upon valid search warrant and only by a licensed physician. I'm repeating this again because it's really important. You're going to be tested on that. And, uh, you know, you're not going to pass the post-testing unless you know those things. Treatment of prisoners. We have a variety of penal code sections which basically say when the person is in your custody and care that you have to take care of them. PC 146, Inhumanity to Prisoners, is a misdemeanor fine, $4,000. That's not allowing them to go to the bathroom or having them living in feces or not feeding them for two or three days. And part of that is that you are supposed to lose your job as a law enforcement officer, I believe that section says. So look at PC 146. 149 is assault by public officers. This is a felony or wobbler. $10,000 plus confinement depending on the injury to the victim. Uh, 673 is cruel and unusual punishment, which would be lack of care that would impair the health of a prisoner, not allowing them to get their medicines or leaving them in a very filthy environment. One of the other things we have to be mindful of is we don't allow weapons in the jail. We don't even allow the cops to bring weapons in the jail. Under PC 4574, it is a felony to knowingly bring or send any firearm, deadly weapon, or explosive device into any city, county jail, or custody facility. A felony with two, three, or four years. Officers are required to lock their weapons in their patrol car or in an approved locker prior to entering the facility. And most departments have facilities 
with lock boxes where you lock your gun up and it's you either set a combo lock that's that's only known to you or you take a key with you into the jail and they have what's called a sally port meaning that you walk into one holding area the door closes behind you it's controlled by the jailer you lock your gun up once your gun is locked up the second door opens and you walk through then that closes again and it separates the the inmates all the time from where the gun lockup is if you review the notes for lecture five custody you'll see a homework assignment I want you to write a two-page paper, no more than two pages, on jail safety issues, including, but not limited to. Now, that means you can either pick one of these things, or you can pick a couple of these things if you think they're related. Jail rape, escapes, gang violence in jail, jail suicide, medical pre-screening problems or mistakes, or classification. It could even be classification mistakes, putting the wrong people in wrong cells. What do you see as problems with the system that we need to work on to improve the safety for prisoners? So this is totally up to you. I'm just, I'm really looking at your writing skills. I'm really looking for grammar, spelling, the things that are really important to me. You could take whatever information you want. Please don't make it a cut and paste because uh, I'm not going to go for that. If I find the actual article myself and it looks like you just cut and pasted it in, I'm not with it. So what I would like you to do is start off with find some general stuff. What is your opinion about it? Give some examples. And then I want the last part of it, the last paragraph two, to be your opinion about how can we correct the problem. All right? And um, that's going to be the end of lecture number five on custody. Make sure that you're reading your textbook and keeping up with your homework, discussion, and exam scheduled assignments.